worked for Pacific Gas and Electric Company. And uh, as I grew up and was young, I was fascinated watching the linemen. Yeah. So I actually, we had a cabin in the mountains of Santa Cruz and uh, we'd go up there in the summers and I actually built some lines out of trees and stuff. My dad bought me old uh, salvage materials and I had a little wagon with a derrick on. I actually started climbing when I was about seven. Amazing. Amazing. So, you know, it was something that I, just like you said, I, it was kind of in my in my blood, you know. And, yeah. 100%. And enjoyed it for sure. Well, first off, Alan, I just want to say it's an honor and a pleasure to have you on the show. Um, I've followed a little bit of your career. I've been with Quanta myself for about 12 years, kind of a little bit in between there. Um, I wasn't with Quanta Company, but I'm a second generation lineman. My father was a lineman before me, ran a small power line company out of central British Columbia, Canada ended up selling to Quanta, sell, sold to Alltech and Alltech as a Quanta company. And then later actually became, uh, ended up becoming president of Alltech. And so I've, I've followed a little bit of yourself, obviously through the book, but through Quanta as well. And uh, my dad actually uh, got me a copy of your, your book. And he was at one of the, one of the, Quanta events that presidents find themselves at and you were there and had the book signed by you. So that was, uh, that was pretty cool. It's the one I've been reading here recently. So I just want to say it's a pleasure to have you on the show and, and welcome to Powerline Podcast. Yeah, well, Brian, I, I was excited about being on. I appreciate you having me and, you know, hopefully we can have, uh, you know, a good conversation. I've always been impressed with the Canadian end of the power business, you know, They've been really, if you look back upon all of the innovations and things that have been done in Canada, it's been pretty darn amazing. We love it. BC Hydro, Fortis BC, yeah. Hydro Quebec, Manitoba Hydro, all of the country companies up there are pretty darn progressive, you know, so. You know, yeah, the, I think the terrain, uh, the terrain in Canada really forces you to be progressive in yeah, I know, so. methods of act. Like I, I've been a part of a couple of, uh, I did, I was bare hand trained by Quanta back in 2014 and then recently again. But in, in that time we were doing some work on the 500 KV lines in BC and access was a real issue. We uh, had a contract to change like, something like 30,000 spacers on four bundle 500 lines and access through the mountains was a heck of a challenge. So we had to work with uh, Transport Canada and WorkSafe BC to develop uh, a method using helicopters because in Canada, it's a little different than the United States. You can't just go hook onto the bottom of a long line and fly anywhere you want. It had to be, it had to be approved. And the only industry using this method was the like search and rescue, the rescue industry using a, a, a means of hooking a guy on a long line of a helicopter and reaching inaccessible areas. So we worked with both entities and developed a method and a system for using the long line to, to access 500 KV lines and set a person on there and change spacers or do whatever we need to to, uh, needed to do so i think the mountains and the terrain is what i'm getting at is it like forces you to be progressive and think yeah. outside the box and in in the power line industry yeah well it's amazing how important helicopters become for those types of operations yeah hard to imagine doing a space replacement without them for sure we were uh all tech was a part of um part of the construction of a cantonary system, which I'm sure you're aware of in, in the mountains of BC, there's those two cantonary systems in the Kildala pass and Altec was a part of that. But if I look back, I, I went and looked back at some older photos of how they actually built the line. And you started reading about the helicopters that showed up in the forties, the helicopter that showed up, they called it an egg beater because it looked like an egg beater. And it, when it flew into um, Vancouver airport on its way to Terrace or Kitimat, 
it was the largest helicopter that they had ever seen at the Vancouver airport at that time. And it was the first one of its size used for construction in Canada at the time. And you see it parked on a little, on a little flat surface in the mountains and those rugged mountains. And then you see what we use them for today. Just the contrast is so vast. It's, it's really cool to see. Oh, I bet. I bet. Cool. Um, well, let's start with a, let's start with a little bit of your history and start at the beginning. Like we just got into, um, I like that story about you as a youngster building power lines. So how did this kind of all, all begin for you? Start where you grew up and a little bit about your family life when you grew up. Yeah. Like I mentioned, my dad worked for the power company and, and, uh, so I used to go with him occasionally and watch the linemen work on the poles. And like I say, it fascinated me. And, uh, so he got a pair of climbers and cut them down because I was only seven years old and he cut them down long enough at the right length for me. And then I started to learn to climb. And, and so I would build some lines around the cabin we lived in. Uh, you know, I used trees and I did have some cross arms and wire and stuff that he had brought from the power company. And then when the, we'd have rains and storms there and the, it, uh, limbs and stuff would tear my lines down, I'd go out and fix them, you know, so that was kind of a, a, of a neat thing for me. Then when I got into high school, I, I kind of changed a little bit, you know, I wasn't exactly sure whether to go on to further education or not, and, you know, I, I ultimately decided, no, I want to go to the power company, so I started and actually worked as a summer groundman when I was in high school as a junior, uh, I worked in the summers as a groundman on a line crew. And then when I graduated, uh, I, I got on the line crew as a groundman with Pacific Gas and Electric Company. And then from there, I advanced to an apprentice lineman, lineman, line foreman, line superintendent. And while I was at pg and &E, they had what they call tuition refund and so I went back to school in the evenings at Santa Clara University and got a bachelor's degree in electrical engineering while I was working for PG&E. And, you know, that ended up opening a lot of doors for me in terms of advancement into management. And so I was actually a, a line foreman and a line superintendent for about 15, 20 years. And then I got into management. Uh, you know, I had opportunities because my that degree helped me. I got into management and then moved up quite a bit within uh, PG&E. And then ultimately, while I was at PG&E, uh, I was actually one of the very first persons. This was about mm, 1965. PG&E built a 500 kV inner tide from the Northwest tied with Bonneville Power Administration came down through the Pacific Gas and Electric Service Territory and ultimately tied with Southern Cal Edison in Los Angeles. And so that was new to PG&E. And when we built the line, then they needed to start working on it hot. And I was one of the first guys and my crew to learn working hot on 500 kV in about 1965. And at that time it was, it was hot sticks. We weren't doing the bare hand yet, that would follow, but we learned how to work on it with long hot sticks. And so I got involved with that early on. That was kind of a, a little bit of a, of a highlight of my career. And then after I was at PG&E about 35 years, uh, I had the opportunity when and I was eligible for retirement. I had the opportunity uh, and was recruited by Clallam County Public Utility District in Port Angeles, Washington as the general superintendent. So I moved up to Port Angeles, Washington uh, as the general superintendent over the engineering and operations with the power company there, a small public utility. And so that gave me a different perspective coming from a big investor-owned utility like PG&E to a smaller utility. So that was very uh, 
very good for me. And I, and I learned quite a bit there and enjoyed it. And then from there, uh, again, I had a chance to retire and I was deciding on where to go. And so I moved to Boise, Idaho, knowing Northwest Lineman College was there. And when I got to Boise, I went out to the Lineman College and met the owner there and, uh, you know, introduced myself and he needed instructors. So I actually started doing some instructing at the Lineman College. And that actually then turned out to be a little bit more of a permanent job. And then I became an owner of the college. And so I spent then 20 years with Northwest Lineman College. Wow. And uh, then from there, you know, moved to, uh, to where I am now. So, you know, I've kind of had a, a lot of different perceptions of the power industry. And, uh, you know, I, I, can, I can truly say that all my, my best moments were actually on the cruise. Yeah. As I look back on all the memories that I have, you know, and you have them too, uh, the, the, the ones that I really enjoy, I think I enjoyed it most when I was actually on the cruise. I think I enjoyed being a line foreman quite a bit. I, you know, I figured that I, you know, had, you know, took good care of my crew, yeah. trained them and that sort of thing. But, uh, you know, certainly been a, certainly been a, a good career. And then in 2008, I was inducted in the International Alignment Hall of Fame. And that was kind of an honor for me uh, to have that as kind of a, you know, a cap off on my career, if you will. No kidding. There's so much to unpack there. That um, let's okay. I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you a few questions, kind of based on all of that. Go back to the beginning. You said when you went into high school, um, you weren't sure if line work was something that you wanted to pursue. Um, I had a very similar, very similar circumstance. Like I grew up with uh line work just in the family it's what was always around my like i said my dad owned a power line company and back in those days uh in a small town in a in in bc it was hard to get linemen so he often had to put linemen up at his house uh give him like room and board that way because it was hard to pay living out allowance or per diems or things like that so they would kind of do that and and mom and dad worked together on the business Mom did all the um, administrative work and and such, and but then also ran the family and fed the linemen and put them up and all of that stuff in the background. I was just always around it, and it's not something I really wanted to do. Even though, like same as you, I worked as a groundman through high school, or just painted trailers and sorted bucket trucks and tools and things, whatever I could do at the shop. And, uh, but it's not something I ever wanted to do until a foreman that was working for my dad, uh, pulled me aside and just said like, are you crazy for not taking this opportunity? It's like something I was almost dismissing. And he's like, you have like a golden ticket. He's like, you're, you're, you're 20. Just get your trade ticket, figure your life out after. He's like, you're, you're not going to regret doing this. The second I did it, the second I climbed my first pole, um, I was always fairly athletic. I climbed very well right from the beginning, just did. And I was hooked. And from that point on, really never looked back. It was the greatest thing, greatest decision I made. And I'm so happy he made me like think differently about that. So I don't know. What was the, what was the moment for you where you just kind of, was it like that? Or was it just like, you just made the decision to actually pursue it? Right. It was a little bit like that. I, you know, first of all, probably pretty similar. Of course, you really had some good roots with your dad and your mom doing all of that. Well, you were really right next to it. Uh, I was a little bit, uh, you know, removed from it at that stage. You know, there, there were obviously, I had friends that were using, were going on other opportunities. A lot of them were going to advanced education, to colleges and stuff. And so, you know, I, I actually thought about that to some degree, uh, go, going to electrical engineering right then. Mm -hmm. But as I got closer to graduating from high school, somehow it just, I just couldn't visualize myself not becoming a lineman. So 
uh, you know, it just naturally evolved. And, and, you know, it was just one of those things for a little bit, I thought about something else, but I think down deep, I was always, you know, inclined to go with alignment. And, and uh, you, you know, I always say this to our students, uh, you know, prospective students, I have never, and yeah, I'll bet you haven't either. I have never talked to anybody like you or I or somebody in the trade, never, and asked them, okay, if you could turn your life back and start all over again, would you still have done what you did and became a lineman? Every one of them says, oh, I would have never done anything differently. So I've never, ever had somebody say, no, I think I'd rather been an architect or, yeah. <laughs> you know, some other profession. So I think everybody probably uh, all feels the same way about, you know, the passion for the trade. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I 100% agree with you on that one. And uh, so you, you've, you've taught and mentored hundreds thousands maybe of students through nlc and kind of beyond so i'm sure you've got a lot of random questions from youngsters about what they need to do to get into the trade and and like do i really need to get this training or what training do i need or just all those sorts of questions i get a lot of them through social media and i i always try to answer them the best i can um but what there's a few of them that they really try to cheap out on the amount of training they need to get into the core, like into, into line work. And I say like, just do whatever you can do to set yourself apart from the guy beside you, like whatever that is. And they're like, well, what, what do I need to do? I'm like, do the research and do what you need to do. Like yourself, for example, you know, on the side, pursued an electrical engineering degree, you know, that set you apart. And, and you're saying it provided you a lot of opportunities that may not have been there. Um, and it's, it's hard to really calculate the opportunities that that would have provided. So like, what's your advice? Is it similar to youngsters when they ask you these questions? Is it similar? Like you need to set yourself apart and, and do above and beyond, or what do you offer for advice? Yeah, you know, that's always, that's always good advice, obviously, to, to set themselves apart. Because, you know, as yourself, or when you get to some of these jobs, they're pretty competitive. And to get the good jobs, you've got to be the one that, you know, that stands out. There's a couple things that are fairly interesting now that, that my, the instructors came to me about two or three years ago. And we get, when we get students at NLC, they're coming off the street, wanting to become, uh, you know, ultimately linemen. And they're coming for this fundamental pre-apprentice training to get them ready then ultimately to enter an apprenticeship. And so, you know, they've done a little research before they do that. And there's mm -hmm. a fair tuition. So they've thought it out pretty good. What's happened though, and the trend is crazy. The instructors come to me now and they say, hey, Alan, we got these guys out here now who have never even used a hammer or a screwdriver or a wrench. All they've done is text or, you know, yeah. on the, you know, the, the, the digital devices. And, and so they have to go back and even get these kids up on hand tools and fundamental mechanical you know, abilities and, and, and that sort of thing. So, you know, I, I've always now, you know, even talked to kids about, you know, it's good to use your hands yeah. and, and actually do work with tools and stuff. It's, it's uh, you know, coming in totally void of anything on the tools is kind of tough for some of them. We get the farm kids, they come in, they monkey wrench stuff on the farm, driven equipment. Most of them are pretty good. But that, anyway, that's kind of a trend that we've seen lately is the kids not being too mechanically inclined. Yeah. But the other, the other element of it is they really, they really have to be dedicated to learn academically and develop their skills. 
you know, physically. So they have to really put in the effort. It's a little easier for some than others, but as you know, it's not a cakewalk coming into the trade. You have to work hard, you have to study hard, you have to practice, you have to learn hard. The rewards are there, but it doesn't come easy. So I always try to prepare them to make the best effort they can, both academically and in the field in developing their skills and abilities and learn more. You know, right now there's such a fire hose of information available to these kids. With the internet, there's just all kinds of things. And I encourage them to get on websites like yours, sign up and listen to the podcasts or other websites. Yeah, they're just, a, you know, as much out there as you want to take the time to absorb. Yeah. But yeah. nothing short of making the effort. I guess that's the bottom line I try to do. I, I agree with you as well that technology, though it's been really great, you seem to lose a lot of that skill development because things aren't hard like take driving, for example, just the, the use of automatic transmissions is one, one example, like most diggers and buckets are automatics now. And, yeah. you know, like, I'm sure you can attest to some of the trucks you drove in the past, even myself, when I first started, we had, you know, old international diggers that had a split rear end, it, like they were hard to drive. Like they were really hard to drive. Like you would, you, would, it wasn't uncommon to blow axles because that, that rear end wouldn't drop in and, or it would drop in at the wrong time and it would just grenade your rear axle or I don't know, just things were, it seemed like things are getting easier, which is great. That is good. Technology is making these advancements and making things easier. But when I think about growing up, like yeah. I did, I grew up, riding dirt bikes and my my oldest son is 16 now just learning how to drive and i'm like i i learned how to drive at 14 like my mom i remember my mom letting me drive home from school at 14 and that wasn't even very long ago like that was just yeah. in the 90s like yeah. um i don't know like you said farm kids grow up a little different um but it's it's hard to manage that <laughs> yeah yeah that's true no question about how the changes are, you know, but you, you know, right now, I'm still have to work with tools, you know, yeah. they still use hand tools. <laughs> and uh, so when you start totally, like some of these kids have never used any tools, it's, it's you know, there's an adjustment period just to get uh, up to speed on using tools. Yeah. What was your, uh, what was your, when you became a, a groundman for the power company, what was some of the, the challenges in and amongst that? Like, um, I think there's something that you could probably offer the young guys getting in around that, like getting into the trade at that age. Like you said, you were 16. Yeah. I worked as a summer hire okay. at, six, at 16 when I actually, uh, hired on permanently, I was 18. Okay. All right. Um, let's move to, um, you said you were involved in a 500 KV project and it was one of the first ones down to Bonneville. Is that what, correct? Yeah, and it was it, a lot, um, the major inner tie coming to California, parallel 500 KV lines that brought power from the Northwest, which was Bonneville, which is predominantly hmm. hydroelectric power down through California to the Southern California. California Edison in Southern California. And so the line was was pretty vital once it was in in the summer when uh, the hydro production was maybe a little bit low. Uh, we could shift power from the south to the north and vice versa. So it became they both became pretty critical line for sure as 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 the lines you 500 KB lines in Canada are. Yeah. And you said that you were, you, your crew um, were some of the, you did some of the first live line work on 500. Um, what was that like developing the work practices, tooling? Like, what, what was that like being a part of it? Well, it, it was, it was pretty much in the beginning. There had been some work done uh, by some of the other companies 
in the US with, with 500 KB, particularly 345. Is when we work closely with AB Chance, they were going to provide the tools. So they had their product demonstrators out, and we worked with them in terms of you know, understanding which sticks would be best for us, the yokes, the strain poles, you know, the hot sticks. And so we kind of, you know, worked with them and then established the methods that would work on the type of towers that we had. The type we had, with the outside phases were vertical suspension. The center phase was a V-string configuration. So we rigged a little differently for the V-string than we did on the outside string. And then the dead ends, we had to, we had to come up with it, with it, with a board that we actually worked on. And, uh, you know, so some of it was fairly innovative, but we relied pretty heavily on chance and the experience and their tool making that, uh, that they had. But uh, it was a pretty neat experience at the time for sure. What do you see, what do you see different between like, um, like if you, if you're looking at safety in the trade, what are some of the advancements in safety that you really noticed, uh, like then versus now kind of advancements? Well, the, I think the biggest thing, the single biggest thing is when I started and was an apprentice in Lyman, we did almost maybe 80% of the work from the pole. We climbed every day. Almost all the work was done from the hooks on the poles. We did have, uh, you know, uh, uh, aerial lift rigs in the yard, but limited, and they were only usually used for special stuff. And so today, you know, with everybody using aerial lift rigs, that's obviously made a huge improvement mm -hmm. in safety. So uh, obviously, for me going way back to climbing the aerial lift rig is is obviously the biggest the biggest improvement there. Do you and find then, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Then from there there's you know there's just a, a lot of the clothing has improved. Mm. And of course the big thing today, at least for me, is the fall protection if you are climbing, you know. Yeah. Geez, when I first started at Northwest Lyman College, you could imagine we had 40 or 50 students there that have never climbed before. And man, I mean, we piled sawdust up around the base of the poles because it was frequent for them to, you know, to cut out and fall. And fortunately, we never did have anybody really seriously injured. It was amazing that we didn't. But now with the advent of the fall arrest equipment, you know, that's made climbing and working off the pole a whole heck of a lot safer too. So, you know, those are probably two of the biggest things right there, the aerial lift and then the fall arrest equipment. What do you think about um, the tech, like climbing technique? Uh, have you seen it change with the development of like the new fall arrests for climbing poles? Have you seen technique change? You know, I, I think so for sure. It, it, it's it's it, it's it's completely different, and uh, you know, I think now with a hundred percent attachment, you know, as they go up the pole, uh, you know, it's, it's it takes the guy quite a bit longer to go up. And when they first came out with it, you know, there was a lot of you know controversy among the veteran linemen that hey, how fast are these guys going to get up a pole? you know, to help somebody that's in trouble. And, you know, there was a lot of issues surrounding rescuing somebody with, with the new equipment. But, uh, you know, over time, uh, you know, there's still some basics in terms of gaff placement and keeping your knees straight and those kinds of things that, that run through. But, uh, you know, it's really quite a bit different uh, you know, climbing with the fall arrest equipment for sure. Yeah. Especially when you come to instruction, you pass another belt over the top and, you know, it, it's, it's, it's quite a bit different, but uh, it's amazing. The guys get pretty good at it. I see them at the rodeos, you know, yeah. they're pretty good at it for sure. I get a ton of young, young guys, men and women, um, on social media and, and listening to the podcast and, 
So I always like to try to put in as much advice for them because it's almost like the, the frequently asked questions that I get. I, I often pass those questions along to a lot of the guests, just like, what are your thoughts and opinions on it? So like, what are your, uh, another one is like uh, around climbing. That's why I'm asking some of these climbing questions is like, so what advice would you have about somebody learning to climb? Like you've been an instructor at a place like NLC for a long time. What's your advice to these guys when they get on a pole for the first time or are going to practice climbing? What's your advice for them? Well, it, it, a little bit depends on some of them have a little trouble with heights to start with. So those individuals that get a little fear with getting up high will always have them to kind of take it gradually. Get up, you know, maybe just a little bit. Do some things with your hands. You divert your attention from looking down. And then gradually become more accustomed to, to the height. Some, some of the students, they, they are not too bothered by height. They can go up quite a bit bigger. So we typically don't try to push somebody that's a little bit reticent of heights too much in those first two or three days and let them gradually become uh, accustomed to it. We tell them that this will go away over time. Once you start to work up above and, and get your mind preoccupied and it becomes more natural, you know, that it, that it, you know, the fear of height can be overcome by those individuals. So uh, it's just a little patience with them, I think. And, and, and usually we don't have too much trouble with that. They usually, uh, yeah. you know, will, will, will be able to adapt. They feel a little more comfortable now. I've talked to them about the fall and rest equipment. They do feel a little more comfortable with having that on. Mm -hmm. I, that's often what I, uh, I, I like to ice climb to Canadian. So we climb frozen waterfalls for fun. Um, and people always ask me, is that crazy? Does it seem crazy? I'm like, you just really have to trust your gear. And it's the same thing that I tell them about line work as well is get comfortable in the gear and start trusting that the gear was made for doing this job. So if you use, if you respect and use the gear properly, properly, you shouldn't have an issue because that's what it's designed and engineered for so that you can really put a lot of trust and faith in the gear. Yeah, that's for sure. Yeah. Um, any other projects through your career that you were like, you wanted to highlight or that were a, a big highlight in your career? Um, well, you know, there is, there is a, a couple of them. Uh, one of them, involved when I was with Pacific Gas and Electric, I worked in Bakersfield, California, which is kind of to the southern part of the pg and &E service territory, a fairly big city, a lot of oil in the area, uh, a lot of, uh, you know, influential people live there. And they had a, an area, oh, it was about, oh, maybe 10 square miles. Uh, had underground residential distribution. And all of a sudden, for whatever reason, in that particular area, they started having all kinds of cable failures. And I mean, it was bad. They were having outages like you couldn't believe. And it was causing just problems. The customers were raising heck, the cities were raising heck. They talked about getting PG&E out of there. So PG&E had to make just an off-the-wall express project to do something. So they made me in charge of the overall project to replace all of the underground conductor in this area. And I mean, it was a big job. That's and massive. Most of it was direct buried. We had to do directional boring. And I mean, a massive underground project in light at the same time with all these cable failures happening. So it was a lot of PR work on one end that we were doing everything we could and resolving problems. But on the other end, then, there was a lot of organizational elements as well, where we had to plan. We had crews in from all over, all kinds of equipment. We were infrareding constantly to try to keep up ahead of the outage. Anyway, that was a big project, multi-million dollar project that 
I was actually in charge of that actually turned out pretty good that I was, uh, you know, met a lot of guys here. And so I enjoyed that pretty well. So that was a pretty big project. And then, you know, I figured that we'd probably discuss maybe the American Lineman book a little bit. We definitely um, will get into American Lyman book for sure. That's uh, that was a big project. And, sure. I, and so maybe a little background on that. One of the things when I got to Northwest Lyman College, <clears throat> we kind of adopted and got into the uh, belief that we wanted the students to understand a little bit of how we got where we are. The new student. It just didn't happen. You know, there's a lot of trial and error and work by all these pioneer linemen, developed these methods, took risks, and all. So we wanted the students to know a little bit of how we got. So we promoted and weaved in a little bit of history into the trade. And we had some displays there at the college showing some of the old stuff. And uh, so when we did that, we, we looked through history and if you look through history and go back to the beginning of the power and telegraph system, you won't find much about the linemen. You're going to read more about the inventors like Tesla and Edison. You're going to read about the big power plants. And, but you're not going to really see much about linemen and all the work that linemen did building these systems. So at that point, we decided, hey, you know, we, we're going to put together a publication that, uh, that honors linemen and, and talks about and, and documents all the accomplishments they've made. So we started, and the title of the book was Risk and Reward. We started. It wasn't the American linemen. So when I started... You know, I figured I'd start at the beginning and, uh, you know, did a lot of research. You know, I was fairly familiar with a lot of the history, but, you know, it clearly had to do a lot of research, contacted a lot of other people. And then it gradually came together, uh, you know, with, with the evolution of line work. And then uh, the actual, one of the ladies that was laying the book out said, well, you know, hey, you know, this is kind of American, you know, it could, we should, what about calling it the American line? You know? And we had a lot of Canadian stuff in it at the time because Canadian, you know, had done a lot of work too. But anyway, we settled in the title changed to American line. And so, uh, but the, the intent was to capture at least and document of uh, what linemen have done over the years. And I can truly say that even as a lineman, once I got through the book, I was so much in awe of linemen after reading all of the things they have done over the years. It was amazing to me just what was accomplished. And I tried at one time to stack up all the major storms and in Canada too. And, and what they had done in terms of poles replaced and customers restored, but it got overwhelming. There was so much I couldn't, I couldn't wrap my arms around it. You know? and it is you amazing. Know, that's really known for rallying mm -hmm. when you have all these natural catastrophes. But uh, anyway, so the book kind of came together. I started, uh, I started working on it. And it took about, I just worked on it in the evenings. I wasn't working on it. Well, I, and I wasn't really working on it solid. I'd work on it one night and then the next night maybe. And so it took about five years to actually get everything together and get it to where it was. Uh, but the one thing that's uh, neat I'll share with you, Ryan, is that, that I was paranoid. I was paranoid that once a book would come out, that people, some people would say, uh, you know, hey, you didn't even mention this, or you missed this, some 
fairly major element, you know. God, that bothered me. And I, yeah. and, but I can truly say that since it's been out, I've never had anybody say, well, you should have this in there. You yeah. didn't do this. You know, so at least it, it, I think it's a fairly full coverage of what the linemen have done over the years. I think, I think you've nailed it. Like, again, it, it shows. Like, I read, I was reading the forward and, and a little bit at the beginning here and just, your it says it says in there i think it was aaron that wrote this like or maybe you wrote it your profession passion and hobby are all one and that 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 shows through the book and and thank you for that because there's a a lot of us like we were talking about earlier that when you're a line when you become a lineman and, and it grabs a hold of you and that it's with you forever and to have uh, a record of what you love and are passionate about um, in a book like this, it's something special and it took the right person to put that together um, because I, I, I could honestly say I haven't met a lot of linemen that could put something like this together and uh, and it's, it's special and it's good. And I, I think you absolutely nailed it. You, you, accomplished everything that needed to be accomplished in it and it's it's in it as far as i'm concerned it's it's pretty cool to have there's so much in in this book that it blows my mind every time i open it i see something new in it and learn something new about who Lyman are and what we did and what our history is like and what we've gone through so we we really did like you mentioned earlier like you you see a lot historians gather all that information about the inventors and the power stations and that's captured really well they did a good job on that they haven't done a good job with linemen it's hard to find stuff about linemen and it's a big reason why i started this podcast as well is i love storytelling and i wanted to i'm not a very good writer i, I love writing <laughs> but i'm not very good at it <laughs> um so I wanted to capture stories, our stories in a modern way. And so I figured I could talk and have conversations and learn how to interview people and, and try to capture line stories for history and put that on the internet. So it's there and somebody can go listen to them later in life. Right. And that's what I wanted to do. Contribute. That's my contribution to the line trade as well, but yours in this book, it, it's, it's, it's fascinating. I, I really, uh, I love it a lot. Well, and, and it's an equal contribution. You're, you, you know, you're making it now with your podcasts and, and it's all, uh, you know, it's all good for the trade, for sure. One thing to share with you, uh, Brian, while, while we're on this, one very, in my career, one thing that influenced me, uh, probably uh, in the safety element more than anything else. Uh, I had a friend, a close friend, went to high school together, played football together on the high school football team, uh, graduated high school together, and went to work for PG&E. Both of us went to work for PG&E. And we came up a little bit. He became a lineman and then went over to a troubleman. That was the route you could take a troubleman. I became a lineman, went to line foreman. So here we are now. I'm a line foreman and he's a troubleman. Uh, again, my best friend ever, his wife and my wife were friends. So, you know, we went hunting together, we went deer hunting together, all kinds of off the job activity. Anyway, one day I'm with my crew at a shopping center uh, in Salinas, California. We're installing some underground, 600 amp underground for a shopping center. So I'm there. And uh, the, the actual field line foreman, who was kind of a line superintendent, happened to be at my job site in his pickup. And we hear on the radio uh, that, hey, we, you know, there's a call from a customer that there's a PG&E man hanging from a pole on Zabala Road. And that didn't sound good, as you can imagine. So the line superintendent says, hey, Throw your tools in here. Let's go. Let's let's head down there. So I jumped in with him and we head down the road. This Zabala Road was an agricultural area. 
out of town. So I was in town and we were about 15, 20 minutes out of town. So we knew the location of where the, the guy had reported the PG&E man hanging from the pole. So we're driving along, we come down, it's an agricultural area. And I can look out across this lettuce field, I see this pump pole down at the end, and I can see I got a guy hanging from a pole. At the secondary level, his back's almost bent double over backwards. So we haul up there to the pole and there he is hanging from the pole, you know. So I get, get out, throw on my climbers, jet up the pole, and I get there and, and I can see that he's dead for sure. But we lower him down and, and do all of the things he tried to do in terms of mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation and take him in. But he had been dead for some time. And what had happened is he was actually there on a trouble call that the pump wasn't working and the transformer bank wasn't working. And so what we could figure out, it, there was, couldn't obviously find out what he was at, actually happened. Uh, but when you took his gloves off, uh, he had leather gloves off, both hands were burnt right to the bone and the fingers on both sides. So what, what had happened then we started to figure it out. There was some blown fuses laying down to pole. He had got there on a no power complaint. And so he found some fuses blown on the transformer bank and tried to refuse the transformer bank. And the fuses must have blown again. And so he tried then to open the secondary onto the pump service so that he could isolate the pump service then test the transformer bank individually to see if the trouble was in the transformer bank and not in the surface. Well, evidently, when the fuse blow, he, he, he went ahead then to isolate the secondary, but he didn't open the other two fuses. And the transformer was shorted internally and putting out high voltage through the windings. And when he opened the secondary, he got in series with it, oh, and he's right there. And of course, that's what that's what did him in. But anyway, uh, to make a long story short, that had a lasting impression on me because when I got in that night, you know, or that right after that, I got in. You know, the yard you can imagine it's in a turmoil, and they said, "Well, hey, Drew, you've got to tell his wife. You're the only one that can tell her." Mm -hmm. I said, yeah. So I had to go through that. And uh, anyway, as you might imagine, that had a long uh, lasting impression on him. He was a little bit, when we came up, he was a little bit on the side where he might take a chance. He wasn't always as safe as he should in wearing his equipment. Where I was just the opposite. I, would, I always wore my equipment, always followed the rules and procedures, you know. And so that had a big impact on me to always promote safety, you know. Yeah. Experience something like that firsthand, uh, you know, was something that, you know, had a big uh, impact on me. But anyway, I thought I'd share that with you as a little background. I, I appreciate you sharing that. And that, that's massive advice for anybody listening that, you know, s safety it's it's hard because people throw the safety word around and everyone has their opinions on the word safety and how it's used but when it comes down to it you in in a position as a lineman you have to watch out for yourself and you have to watch out for the people that you care most about and that you're working beside that's that's your job as a lineman and so take the safety word however you want to however you want to do it but um the procedures that are in place, the tools and equipment used, they're all developed and it's written in red. Like it's, it's written in blood. Like somebody had a serious incident where they hurt themselves or passed. And these things were developed usually from that, you know, very rarely something is developed 
<laughs> um, without it having had an incident to develop it. Um, so just remember that, like, and that's the reason why we follow procedures accordingly and why we use safety gear and PPE and safety departments like to throw the words around the word around safety, be safer, blah, blah, blah. But just remember the real, the real reason, you know, if, if you are a true tradesman and you, you respect the rules and you follow safety procedures, um, you're really going to limit your risk and limit your chances of being hurt or injured. And, you know, not just for you, but for the people you work around as well. And hopefully can get through a long career and look back and have those memories because you're still around. Right. Well, that, and that's really well stated, Ryan. I would totally agree with everything you said there, Richard. And, 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 you know, you can get discussions with younger individuals wanting to enter a career in the power delivery industry and line, and particularly their parents, because their parents are standing behind and they're saying, oh, gosh, I, is it safe for my son to be in the trade? You know, isn't that pretty hazardous? You always get those types of questions. And so, you know, reiterating what you said is, is very important to them. I mean, granted, uh, you know, we know that the job, there are hazards associated with the job. But like you say, you know, they've got years of experience and equipment and trades. If everything's followed, it can be relatively safe. And, uh, you know, it, it's just the importance of training is, is important, the equipment following the rules. We've come a long ways for sure. But and the, listening, uh, and, and uh, I want to add one more thing that I know I didn't do well as a young person. And I, this is just how ex experience and older people and younger versus younger people. When you're younger, you do some stupid things and you don't listen to older people. But now as I'm starting to progress in years, I look back and I go, I really wish I would have listened to the guy, the older guy telling me some piece of advice, whatever that was. One example is just how I was climbing as a young person. I was ripping down the pole. I didn't give a shit about my knees, my back, my anything. I'm young. I'm going to be young forever, right? He looked at me when I got to the bottom of the pole and he just basically called me a flat out idiot for climbing the way I was climbing. He's like, what are you doing? And I was like, what? He's like, you keep climbing like that 20 years, you're not going to have knees left. And I, I was just kind of brushed it off. I did think about it after, and I did adjust my climbing slightly, but not really slightly even the slightest little bit that I did adjust my climbing, it saved my knees that much more, but I have horrible knees. I have horrible knees. Now I probably need surgery on my knees. I haven't had it checked out, but they're bad. They hurt every day. And I really do wish I would have looked after my knees a little bit more. And there's countless examples of that, but just listen to experienced people telling, trying to tell you something and realize that it comes from a place of experience you know, whatever that is, they've seen or done some things. They've had some experiences like yours where they've had to remove a, a, a deceased body from a pole and go through that whole thing. A friend, you know, like it comes from places of experience and you don't want to experience that. That's why they're telling you this. You don't yeah. want bad, bad knees because they have bad knees and it sucks. Yeah. So yeah, listen to yeah, when you're young, you know, you, you, you feel pretty <laughs> invincible sometimes, you know. <laughs> yeah, it only goes so long. <laughs> uh, let's talk more about the, about the book. Um, I had a few more questions definitely about the book. Do you have a favorite story or section from the book? Something that when you're putting it together, it was something that you learned or you really enjoyed putting into it maybe more than the rest. Um, you know, and that's a good question because there's a lot of, there were a lot of interesting things, you know, that the stories that I ran across uh, in the book for sure. But I think, I think the most uh, that fascinated me more than anything was learning about 
the evolution of the hotline mobile. When they first started and decided, okay, you know, we got to, it's important that we develop some means of working on, first of all, they just shut everything down if they were just going to even tap on a new line. And then, you know, they started to come up with different uh, ways of, of working. But, I mean, there were so many different things. Uh, like the, the first taps where the guy screwed the wood pin into the insulator and held it up and, and made contact. I mean, that, that, that got me. That was so interesting. I did and, a, a quick story. I'm sorry, I'm going to interrupt you on that one real quick. I, I, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the social media app, TikTok. Yeah. So, so TikTok, uh, um, you can create short little videos on TikTok and put them out there. So I've done a series of little short videos, taking photos from in your book and then describing that. And that's one of the ones I, I built a little TikTok about oh, the, Mount, wow. the Mount Whitney tap and being the first live line tool. And those t I've put it out a couple of times now. Those uh, those TikToks have collectively had uh, like a hundred thousand views on them, which is it's pretty cool and a lot of a lot of great comments. Uh, yeah, about, wow, cool. I didn't know that. That's yeah. so cool. So yeah. Anyway, continue on. It's it's pretty. Yeah, cool. that that was one. And then and then to to, to see how they actually barehanded early on with some makeshift ladders and platforms and you know. I, I think that was the part of the book that, that fascinated me most. I would just, you know, it's hard to find information about that too. Mm -hmm. uh, because they didn't document that stuff real well. You can bump into it here and there in some of the trade journals and, and things. But I know that, boy, whenever I found anything on hotline work, uh, you know, it, it really, you know, I really tried to capture all of those real early trial and error methods and imagined how it must have been for those linemen to try that because you know yourself god you could get electrocuted and a lot of them were you know with with some of yeah. those early methods have you seen the which i'm sure you have have you seen the uh the old school video on youtube of the guy's first bare handing with that big shield that comes oh, up over yeah. the hole. They had a hole in a uh, hole in knuckle boom and that big yeah. shield. And <laughs> it's yeah. amazing to see them use that. And yeah. some, of the, some of the work practices they use bare handing, mixing, mixing bare hand work on distribution, mixing bare hand work with, um, with sticks and like yeah. cold methods. And uh, super interesting to see. Did you get into bare hand work yourself a little bit? Yes, I did. Yeah, when it started at PG&E, then uh, I got involved in, you know, bonding on. We did a lot of spacer. I did a lot of spacer replacement from helicopter platforms, okay. where we'd actually just sit on the side of the helicopter on the platform, come down, bond on, change the spacers. So we had spacer problems too. But yeah, I, I got involved in. Quite a bit of it. I never did any long line. It was all off the platform. Sure. We just used the long line for access, uh, basically to get on the bundle. Um, it would drop us on the bundle and then it would bring us the buggies and uh, take the spacers, the old spacers away and bring us new spacers if we had, if we had to, if we couldn't get to uh, lowering them with a hand line or something like that. Uh, we use it more for access than we did for, um, for anything like actually working from, from the long line. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Um, you had uh, a few from what I read and, and it looks like you had a few adventures um, collecting stories for the book, or is this uh, maybe just a thing that you like to go do is go out and visit old telegraph lines or things like that. It, it looks like you had a couple of adventures. Um, you want to talk about those a little bit? Yeah. One of the things we did uh, at Northwest Lineman College uh, is when we, you know, as I mentioned before, we wanted the students to, to uh, kind of understand how we got where we are. In the area of Northwest Lyman College in Boise, there was a couple of old hydroelectric plants. And they had, when they were in service, one of them was still in service, uh, the hydro power. 
but they had lines that went out to mines in the area and the lines had been removed years ago, but still there was some of the remnants left there. Some of the poles were left, pole butts, pieces of hardware, guy wires, anchors. And so what we would do is we would usually on a Friday when there's no class, the students didn't have class on Friday, we would go on a line expedition, so to speak, where we'd actually go out and then follow the line on foot and, and then photograph, dig up the artifacts, measure how far apart the poles were, what kind of material they were used, and the students would go along and then we discuss how they might have built this line here. Look at the spans across here. Some, in some cases, they had line shacks along the route of the line to stay in, in the event they were making patrols at night or in the snow and they'd have a place to stay. So uh, those were good times in, in terms of learning a little bit about how the lines were built and what the materials were used. And, and it was interesting, the students just loved it. They asked questions, God, when you'd ask if anybody wants to go on the line expedition with Jesus, they all wanted to go, you know. So that was always a lot of fun, it's just a, actually go out and, and and you did learn quite a bit about you know how the lines might have been built and you certainly learned about how the materials were used and uh, you know so that was a lot of fun i i, I really enjoyed it's it. a lesson in history too that's that's yeah. what i like about it to get out there and, and see a piece of history <laughs> it's neat yeah yeah because you... the lines were pretty historic they they would have their own history yeah. But they, you know, had quite a bit to do with the economy and metals. And again, these lines were feeding the mines, which was an important load, just like the important loads we have now. Yeah. Do you have, uh, have you gone on other like little expeditions on your own just yeah, to find, I find things? Yeah, or? I have. I've gone on a couple here in Idaho since I've been, or excuse me, Utah since I've been here. There's a couple of old lines that have went. Uh, up to the mines, and so uh, you know, I've been on those, and, and it's you never know what you're going to find. It's always interesting. Do you have a bit of a collection yourself of like insulators or tools or material things like that? I don't have anything at this point. I used to have a few insulators. I've got a couple of insulators. Uh, I don't have too many, uh, but I've got maybe four or five insulators. We had a nice collection at Northwest Lyman College. Oh, yeah. Yeah. We have a real nice museum there. But what happened, Quantum has their training headquarters at the Lazy Q. Mm -hmm. And they decided they wanted to put a museum in. And so that we gave them everything from Northwest Lyman College. And then I helped them with the museum. They've got a nice... Uh, display of me there, you know, for helping them at the museum. Yeah. And I guess it's just, I haven't been there. I, I just went through it. Um, I just oh, went through it. Yeah. Last week, I, I'm actually uh, recently started working for uh, QES, Quanta Energized Services. And uh, I've spent some time at the Lazy Q in the last couple of months. And, and oh, okay. uh, I believe they're, uh, I believe they're, um, they're just opening that museum up to the to the public soon here so i had a chance to go through it and it's it's absolutely amazing um, right, I just in, enjoyed my mouth was on like jaw was on the floor the whole time walking around it's it's so cool to see history like that and i, yeah, I can't wait that till it came from us you know yeah. the, the lineman slim movie you've probably seen the movie slam yeah absolutely you probably met a great Bell, Dave Wanamaker there. Yeah, yeah, I know them. I know them well. Yeah, and uh, great uh, Bell, great Bell was with me. I hired him in that Southwest Bakersfield project that I told you about. Okay, replacing all those cables. Great Bell was one of the right hand men that I had. There wow, working on that. So just a little trivia since you met him. I'm going to try, uh, I want to try and get Greg on the, on the show as well. See if he's open to it. Yeah, he'd be good. He'd be yeah. very good. Yeah. Um, I've also, uh, I was trying to get William Haynes Jr. 
on the show. Um, he, he was wanting to do it, but he's, he's elderly and is, uh, I believe he's having some family issues or something at the time. And I haven't been able to get him on yet, but I, I hope to get him on to talk about Slim and his father and writing the book and, and all that kind of stuff would be a neat little story. Uh, yeah, that would be it. And yeah. he is a great guy. Yeah. He's, his wife has Alzheimer's. Yeah. And she's struggling. So I know and she's fell about three or four times. So yeah. I know he, I talked to him uh, maybe been a month ago. Oh, cool. And uh, so he, he would be good. To, yeah. To get, he has a, it's interesting, you know, he wasn't a lineman, obviously. His dad, you know, his dad was earning his career, but boy, has he got a passion for it. Yeah. He loves to talk about the trade and he's met more people. And, and it's fantastic that he's kept, he's really like, he put Slim um, like back into the limelight again, right? And by like by republishing the book and reforwarding yeah. the book out into the world and getting that back in, in people's hands. I thought it was really, really interesting, really cool thing to do as well. Like you said, not being a lineman himself. Um, but being passionate enough about that to put it back out into the world and push it again, um, I thought was really cool. Yeah, his dad would be proud of him for sure, keeping the <laughs> slim stuff alive, you know. Is there anything else from the book that you want to talk about that I maybe didn't ask any questions from, or is that that's coming? Well, to um, mind? Yeah, let me think here for, for a little bit. Um, you know, I think that there were, there were certainly, uh, you know, the the one thing that the book is, is pretty hard to capture, I tried to capture a little bit, but uh, one of the things that's really significant is when World War II took place. And, uh, you know, it was obviously a major conflict. The whole world could have changed if the outcome had been different. And there was a lot at stake in that. And the reason the, the war was won was because of America's industrial might. The planes we produced, the tanks, the guns, the munitions, the ships. God, we put out stuff for the, the British. I mean, that what did the Germans and Japanese in. But behind the scenes, God, there was a lot of work linemen were doing, keeping the power on and build to keep all of these facilities functioning. They were drawing power like you couldn't believe producing all this stuff. And, and there was a lot of work behind the scenes that the linemen did that, uh, you know, it was, I could have almost written a whole book about that. You know, so that, that part of it was, was pretty neat too. I didn't realize till I got into it just how much they did on the power systems so all these production facilities could function at the you're, level of it. You're exactly right. And that's, uh, again, what people just don't realize is when they hear, yeah, we built all this stuff. We built, well, how? Like, it's, it's because of energy and electricity and power that you with that America was able to build that stuff. Yeah. Like, and imagine a time where every ounce of metal was going into, you know, people are taking their frying pans and giving them up because of the metal in them, you know, it, for a lineman or line workers to get some of that, to build lines and keep things going, just all of it must've been a struggle to keep the power on and, and to keep those those facilities using the amount of electricity that they were using to build that stuff um, would have been amazing. You know, now that you're saying this, I, I, I wanted to start a show. I wanted to start a show on this podcast that dives into a little bit of this history. And I didn't quite know where to start because when you Google uh, you know, like if you use Google to Google the history of linemen, you get your book and whatever's in your book. <laughs> and to really dive into a subject like that, that, that's actually one of the first subjects I wanted to talk about was during war times, I wanted to, to dive into the story of linemen through war times. And I listened to a podcast called uh, Hardcore History. And Dan Carlin produces this podcast. He produces one or two of them a year and they're 
like a four or five, six hour account of some historical time. He's not a historian himself, but loves history. So he dives, he, he dove into um, like the, the, the empires of old, you know, like, um, like Xerxes and the Roman empires and like the Persian empires. Anyway, gives you this whole account of the Kings of Kings. And I wanted to give a, 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 like a deep dive into some history of line work and really dive into a story. So if it's ever something that you're interested in <laughs> or wanted to pursue um, gathering some facts for me to help me out on that, I would love to put out a podcast show just once in a while on this platform that dives into the history of an event um, in line work. I thought that that would be well received in the line industry and kind of cool to capture. Yeah, and there's lots of good things to dive into, for sure. Mm -hmm. I mean, you could dive in. There are probably, I could, you know, I mean, there are several good elements you could dive deeper into, like the war production stuff, for sure, or live line work. I mean, almost any of it, you can dive into it uh, a little deeper, and, and, it's, and it's pretty amazing uh, in some cases. Uh, you know, lineman innovation, of, of, of just things linemen themselves have developed and come up with, uh, you know, is, is a subject all the way. There are several really, you know, linemen innovative stuff that they, and they still have been innovate today. You know, that's one of their strong, uh, you know, suits for sure. But I, I get on the phone with, uh, I get on the phone with Brady Hansen, uh, every so often every couple of months and um kind of geek out on history <laughs> of line work and he's got a, a very similar passion for the history of line work and our, our trade and um he's a big big we're going to team up on a little project as well with uh and put it out under the platform uh which is is going to be exciting and cool um but yeah, it's, it's neat to geek out on the history. And I think it's important for linemen that care to, to know, you know, the history of our trade. And who we well, are. You know, one thing that got me is when we first started promoting a little bit of the history for the students, you know, we want them to understand how we got where we are. We knew that, you know, it would just weave it in a little bit with a real important education, but a little history behind some of this stuff as they were learning it. Anyway, we thought, ah, God, we put the museum up. These guys won't care about the history. They won't have any. They, they just brush it. Conversely, it was just the opposite. Even the younger guys, they wanted to go on the line expeditions, like I mentioned. They ask all kinds of questions at the museum. They were holding people's. They were, the interest was a lot higher. I guess we were pleasantly surprised that the interest was a lot higher in the history amongst the younger students coming in than we thought. So that was kind of interesting. I think it's neat to start with that too, right? Like to start with like, this is where, this is the people that came before you. And a lot of times when you start talking to people about line work, like we just mentioned during war times, the background, um, the background setup of what was happening in America. You had these people keeping things running and building the backbone of it in the, in the background that people had no idea was even existing. Like, Oh yeah. Like, well, electricity just comes from that hole in the wall, right? Like, no, it doesn't. There's a lot that goes into making this whole thing happen. And it doesn't just come from the two prong hole in the wall. Like <laughs> it. And once you start talking to people about it and they, they really open up to it, I, I found anyway, like as soon as you start talking about it, they get real interested in um, the history behind it. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, now over the last, oh, I don't know, maybe 10, 15 years, linemen have started to become recognized. Mm -hmm. And they're much more widely known yeah. than they were 10, 15 years ago for all their accomplishments. And, and so, you know, you have Lineman Appreciation Day and, you know, there's just a lot of good things that have been have been happening. So it's really nice to see the linemen getting recognized. And I think it's helping 
more linemen or more people wanting to become linemen. They're saying, hey, you know, mm-hmm. that's really, a, you know, a, a good profession and, you know, it's vital and, you know, they feel, uh, I think it's attracting, you know, maybe more people to get into linemen. It, it definitely is. It definitely is. I, I've been, again, um, the thing I really like about an app like TikTok um, is it, people were making fun of me for going on that app at the, at the beginning. And I jumped on it with the mindset that I want to reach a different age group of people. It was younger people on the app, right? What I was finding when I started to make some of these videos of history of line work and what this trade was, I started getting messages from, from kids, like they're 16 to 19 year old kids on there saying, wow, I was just scrolling through TikTok and I found this, this thing that you're doing. I had no idea this was even a thing. And they're like, I like the outdoors. I like working with my hands. Like, how do I get into this? What do I got to do? I think I want to, and it just started a conversation and a dialogue with these young guys. They maybe never would have even found this job. And now it's something they're thinking about. They're sitting in high school at 16, 17 years old, thinking about possibly getting into a trade when they exit and that trade being line work. And I just think that that's, it's really cool way to reach people. And oh, that's, yeah, yeah. that's so good. Jeez. Yeah. I love to hear that. Yeah. Now, I always promote it, you know, they're not going to accrue a big debt for going to college and, <laughs> you know, and, 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 you know, the linemen make pretty good money and there's lots of upward mobility for those that want to, you know, make the extra effort to move up and take on more responsibility. You know, and, and there's so many things you can do within the trade as well. Like if you look back, certainly look back over your career, the different things that you did from, you go from groundman in the beginning through electrical engineering, you know, yeah. line foreman, working on, working on transmission lines to managing large projects to working at the NLC and training and developing a book like same thing for myself being on the tools to i spent time in management uh, and even starting a podcast like this we all within the same industry same trade completely different things there's lots of opportunity if you're creative enough well you've put in the effort you know i put in the effort absolutely it's good that it's not just handed to you you got to put in the effort but it's sure there for sure What's your advice on, uh, I wanted to grab a couple of thoughts on you, uh, from you, uh, around leadership. Uh, I talk about leadership a lot and ask some leadership type questions to some of the guests. Um, you've obviously been in leadership positions throughout your career. What's some thoughts and advice on leadership for people coming into the trade or just in the trade now? Well, I think, you know, for me, that what, what probably, would stand out in in terms of leadership is uh, you know that there you know there's all kinds of elements that surround being an effective leader, and I think I think that the the thing that I liked I enjoyed the most being uh, a line form. I was the leader of the crew, and I think you know I think I was a pretty good line former and I was pretty successful because first of all I never asked the, the employees to do anything that I wouldn't have done had I been in their shoes. I knew what reality it was. So I never had expectations that weren't, you know, real. And then in in terms of leadership, I tried to be respected. I always tried to keep myself professional so that those underneath me would have respect for me and pay attention to me when I would say something. And, and that, that worked out pretty well because I never let myself digress and, and not professional in terms of how I approached it. And then I always tried to develop the people underneath me, knowing that they would ultimately hopefully become leaders. And if they knew what was expected of me, it would help them. And so I tried to bring them along as best I could in terms of having them understand some of my responsibilities as a line foreman 
and always mentored, if you will, the people underneath me so that they would be successful as they moved along. So I think you certainly have to be patient to be a leader these days. You can't be flying off the handle here. You have to be patient and, and, and be able to work with people and listen to them. And you have to be a good listener too. Uh, you know, I think that's one thing some leaders fall down with. You have to listen a little bit to what's going on, what their concerns are. But I think there's no question that, that leadership is, is, is something that, you know, can be very satisfying. I know myself, I've had people that work for me that have gone on to be su successful, and it's a great feeling for me to know that I may have had some influence yeah. on their outcome and what they're doing today. So those are just a couple of th uh, thoughts on it. You know? mm -hmm. I love it. I agree with everything that you said. It's one thing that um, podcasting has taught me is um, to listen differently. And there's not a lot of people out there. I think I, I certainly didn't listen like this prior to developing this in podcasting is listening with intent to listen, not listening to like what I mean is um, when I, the previous way I used to listen to people would sit there and listen to what they're saying. But as I, I was listening, I would be constantly trying to formulate another thought to, to like rebuttal or come back at them with something um, from created from myself, you know, like, yeah. Oh, but there's a, my opinion or whatever, instead of um, really just sitting and absorbing what the person's saying and then getting them to expand on what they're saying. That's, yeah. that's what podcasting has taught me. Like dive deeper into what the, the person that you're talking to is saying. Don't just cut them off and then spit back your version of whatever story you need to craft to say that back. That podcasting's really taught me to dive deeper into the conversation that way. And I use it every day now just in regular conversation. And it's taken relationships to the next level. Um, it's really helped with things like leadership. And I try to offer that advice to people as much as I can to, to develop that listening with intent muscle, uh, intent to listen. Yeah, I can see where the podcasting would help you with that. I didn't, didn't think of that, but I, I see what you're saying for sure. I had no idea, <clears throat> no idea I was doing it. Um, and when I got into podcasting, I, I, I read a book um, by the late, great Larry King. Um, I think it was called um, how, to, how to Talk to Anybody, Anytime, Anywhere. It's a short book, um, but he is obviously an absolute master at uh, conversation and, and um, interviewing people, obviously. And he put a lot into that book, uh, very simple practices and very simple ideas about how to talk to people and how to how to have a conversation um and how to interview and i'd recommend that book to absolutely anybody because it helps with just general life skills and building relationships and leadership and it's not just for interviewing people it's like how to how to talk to people um, i actually need to read that one again it was, it was a good book that's my first i first read that book after i'd started podcasting and it really got me into thinking differently about how how to communicate wow interesting Okay. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Um, do you have, uh, do you have any other things you wanted to talk about on that, on that side of things before I ask you a few closing questions? Um, yeah, you know, uh, like I said, I think it, it's amazing how you can influence the younger people. Uh, you know, somebody like yourself or myself, that has experience, you, you really have the ability to influence some of the younger people if you can get on the right, you know, wavelength, so to speak, with them and show sincere interest in them. Uh, you know, I think, I think it's probably one of the things that I've enjoyed most in a lot of cases is actually working with individuals getting to know them maybe a little bit better and then helping them, uh, you know, with various skills, you know, that sort of thing. So I think it, it's, it's something that I know I really enjoyed working 
with other people. And then in the training part of it is to training the people to, to, you know, to do what you can to improve their skills. And, uh, you know, you get all kinds. I had, uh, some of the instructors I had, if I had students that wanted to learn, oh my God, I'd just go over backwards trying to help them, show them this, show them that, maybe go a little that. Sometimes you get some guys that are just there and they're not really, they don't have much of an attitude and you can just tell they're just there to get it. And I had a hard time keeping myself up sometimes, even with old people, because you have to treat all the students the same. Yeah. And I get it because you're, you're passionate about what you're doing, right? It's that, that passion. So when you see a spark of interest in the thing that you're interested in, yeah. you, you naturally love talking about it and teaching yeah. it and all that. So I, I get totally get where you're coming from on that. Yeah, that's for sure. Uh -huh, cool. Um, what do you do to keep, uh, keep busy now? Well, uh, like I say, I do some things for Northwest Line College. I do some curriculum development. Um, I like to hike. I hike a lot here in Utah. There's a lot of hiking. And I, I went deer hunting this year. Um, you know, I play some golf. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I, I keep busy. You know, there's, there's always plenty to do, you know. So no problem, uh, no problem keeping busy. And I try to stay abreast. Of what goes on in the industry you know i get all the publications and you know try to stay abreast of what goes on in the power industry as well so kind of like being on the sidelines a little bit cheering everybody else on yeah that's that's awesome that's fantastic and it's important to stay active too like that's that's yeah, really cool oh, it yeah. is. especially when you get older you know i can, i i mm -hmm. i do a lot of that you know you got to keep active both mentally and physically Utah is a place uh, I've really wanted to visit on um, this uh, stinking COVID situation is uh, I'm the type of person that would, I would leave BC on a Friday after work. And if I had a three day weekend, I would drive as far South as I could drive in, in, in a day and a half until I had to turn around and make it the same distance home. I would just sleep in my car and drive the Oregon coast or I'd go to the, the east side of Oregon or get down to California, like as far as I could get in a day and a half just to see wow. what I could see. And, and, uh, I miss that and I haven't done that in a, over a year now, but yeah. I, miss, I miss doing that and I can't wait for it to happen again. Yeah. That COVID changed that really changed things for sure. And yeah. that's part of what last year we ranked pretty low here, you know, yeah. stayed fairly isolated. I did used to have graduations. I would go and speak at graduations and watch the rodeos and stuff. Mm -hmm. Now all that stuff was virtual, you know, so. Yeah. Well, it's important uh, you stay healthy. What do you, do you have, uh, do you read, um, read books or anything like that, that you're reading things that you could pass on to the audience too? Interesting well, books or documentaries or anything like that that you've seen? You know, uh, the uh, I, well, one thing I did quite a bit of research on is a lineman's handbook all the way from the beginning to the end, that, and that's an interesting evolution of that book. You can see I use that a lot, obviously, as the trade, you know, evolved as well. But um, you know, otherwise, uh, you know, I I usually do a lot of reading of the trade magazine. I, I get the trade magazines like TND World and, and others and Incident Prevention and Power Lineman Magazine. I contribute some articles to them occasionally. And so, uh, you know, I read a lot of articles there. They're all good, you know, so anybody that can read any of that, anybody that can listen to your podcasts and prior podcasts are just a wealth of good information. Yeah. There. So, uh, you know, I, I try to read a variety of stuff. I, I read a lot of history stuff, just history of the West and, mm -hmm. you know, other histories as well. But reading certainly a good thing. And, you know, listening to podcasts, especially you can do it while you're walking sometimes. So that's always a neat thing to do. You know? 
that's what I, I really, I'm an avid consumer of podcasts as well. I, I have a, a slight dyslexic problem. So reading is, I'm just a slower reader than, than average. So I consume a lot of audio books and a lot of podcasts, a lot of books through my ears instead of through my eyes. Um, but I love that ability to multitask too. Like with that, that little yeah. bit of, uh, I like to do a lot of things all at once. And so I like to be able to listen to a book and, or a podcast and paint a bedroom or whatever, do, do something else while I'm doing it, drive, whatever. Uh, I really enjoy that about podcasts. I, I like audio for that reason. Yeah. Oh, it's perfect. Perfect. I don't know. Sometimes I, I don't know. By hearing it, I, I it, it, it's easy for me a lot yeah. of times to, to really learn from it. You know, I think I retain some of the stuff better that way. Yeah, I I fully believe in that. That's exactly how I experience it too. I, I when I read, um, when I read, my eyes bounce all over the screen or the page. It's, I'll read the top corner and then the bottom corner and then backwards forward. I, I bounce everywhere. But when I listen, I'm usually pretty focused on what I'm listening to. Um, yeah. Even if I'm doing something different, it's totally different experience than reading with my eyes. I struggle with my eyes. <laughs> yeah. Well, sir, uh, I've had you for an hour and a half. I really, really appreciate your time. And I, I would love to have you on again to dive into some of these topics, maybe a little, a little deeper. Um, but I, I really appreciate your time spending it with us today. And um, yeah, uh, thank you. So yeah, it's, great. Well, it's, great. it's great interacting with you and learning a little bit more about you and what you're doing. And God, I'm impressed, you know, so we're linked up and believe me, you can count on me for anything. If it's a podcast or you want to just bounce something off me or you want cool. you know some information you know that just we're linked up just just get a hold of me love to stay in touch with you and then maybe sometime we'll be able to meet each other potentially there'll be an occasion where it'll be practical for us to get together you know but, yep. uh, that would be fantastic you know, like i say boy don't hesitate to contact me if i can be of any assistance oh, appreciate it thank you very much sir